When war starts, all regular value systems are shaken. Many things that matter in a peaceful life just lose their sense of being. And in this world of chaos, cruelty and uncertainty, it seems like art and creativity go by the wayside. In actuality, the contrary is true. Culture might not affect war directly and immediately, but this doesn't prove it is ineffective. Military firearms aren't the only form of weaponry. In addition to the battles led on the field, it's also crucial to win battles in people's minds. And for this task, art is even more efficient than news reportages, as the former portrays the scars of war, not through lifeless numbers, but through emotional stories that are sure to touch every caring person. So we want to explore how the world of art and creativity has responded to military aggression throughout history. In part one of our Creative Anti-War Manifesto series, we're going to talk about why it's impossible for art to distance itself from events influencing society, the most significant anti-war manifestos of the past, how the portrayal of battlefield has changed during the last centuries, and which symbols and approaches artists can use to talk about war. First of all, let's cover why it's almost impossible for culture to stay away from military conflict. Scientist Dawn Prancati determined five ways art and war are related. We will start with the obvious. Monarchs, dictators and elected world leaders have all commissioned artists to create propaganda and generate popular support for military aggression. At the same time, other artists produce art to promote peace, working either on their own or with the support of anti-war organizations. Next, important pieces of art and architecture have been destroyed during war, both unintentionally and purposefully. The strategy behind this is to dispirit while demonstrating strength on the behalf of the aggressor. With the next strategy, we move from morale to money. Looted art has often been used to finance wars and reward military and political leaders. But not all money is used for dubious purposes. After war's end, art can be used to raise funds for emotionally and physically injured soldiers, as well as displaced refugees. With all the power that art possesses, it has dealt with and reflected on the horrific consequences of military conflicts for many centuries. Let's take a look at the different ways this was done. To emphasize how much war affects ordinary people, artists pay special attention to their often terrifying stories. This is one of the defining images from the Vietnam War. Photographer Nick Ut captured a moment when scared children were running from their village that had just been bombed by a South Vietnamese aircraft. This image dramatically changed the world's view on the US's involvement in Vietnam. Another memorable piece from the same war is a poster titled Q and Babies. A and Babies. The Art Workers Coalition reproduced a photograph of dead Vietnamese women and children in a ditch during the My Lai massacre. The picture is combined with a quote from CBS News television interview with soldier Paul Medlow, who participated in the massacre. And you killed how many at that time? Well, I fired them on automatic, so you can't... You just spray the area, so you can't know how many you've killed, because they were going fast, so I might have killed 10 or 15 of them. Men, women and children, and babies, and babies. Mindful of the great losses and the fact they shouldn't be forgotten, many artists choose to focus on the absence of soldiers and individual tragedies, as opposed to the grand scale losses. The topic of absent soldiers was common, among others, across British, French and German artworks after the First World War. And even when life isn't lost, the cost of military aggression are still way too big. For many soldiers, the process of coming home is as difficult as actual war itself. Veterans often struggle to resume the lives they led before service, 
suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, and coping with drugs and alcohol. This, understandably, affects not only them, but their family members as well. As the popularity of television and digital media grew, they helped make the realities of military conflict close to those who were physically far away from the events and whose families weren't personally affected by the war. The media reduced the space between battlefields and the viewers to convey all the war horrors. Speaking of horrors, it's easy to fall into the trap of romanticizing war when you haven't seen one yourself. But when you do, it's inarguable how much chaos and devastation it brings. Later, we'll focus on why some artists tend to have a slightly naive attitude towards war. As for now, let's take a look at other works of art that draw attention to the chaos of war. Some of them portray harsh realities as they were. Others look for unconventional ways to express the horrors, with surrealism being the answer. And when censoric storylines of the battlefield weren't enough, artists turn to emotional influence. This approach doesn't enclose exact details of combat, but depicts misery and trauma with high impact. Another thing artists pay attention to is the senselessness of the war. In 1971, conceptual artist Chris Burden created the performance piece, Shoot. The idea of performance may seem absurd, but so are the irrational realities of war in which innocent people are killed. Their fate is decided by random chance. As history professor Joanna Bork writes, the mood of war portrayal has undergone some major shifts. This is evident on two levels, generational over centuries and personal over the course of several decades or even years of an artist's life. Prior to the 20th century, there was special admiration for great generals and country leaders. You could also find a lot of religious motives. As time went by, some artists began expressing a general sense of disgruntlement and bitterness. Attention and sympathy have switched from top officials to ordinary soldiers and their families. A new narrative was developed, one that literary scholar Samuel Hines calls Myth of War. It began with innocent young men, their heads full of high abstractions like honour, glory and England, and ended with disillusionment. When it comes to the reasoning of this myth, we couldn't put it better than Jennifer Farrell. Like their countrymen, many artists, writers and intellectuals initially welcomed the war for a range of reasons. Some because of nationalist sentiments or a sense of patriotic duty. Others had a desire to experience an adventure they assumed would be over in a few months, if not weeks. And still, others because of a mistaken belief that, after what they viewed as a final and necessary conflict ended, oppressive political systems would disappear and a more peaceful, spiritual and anti-materialist era would begin. After experiencing war suffering personally, Many people change their opinions dramatically, expressing feelings of loss, betrayal, pacifism, and rage. Case in point, publisher and gallery owner Paul Cassira. In 1914, he founded Kriegerzeit, or Wartime, an art journal supporting war efforts. Just two years later, Cassira became a pacifist and replaced the publication with Der Bilderman, the Picture Man, a journal where artists advocated for peace. Another example, Ernest Ludwig Kirchner. He volunteered for service in the First World War, but soon suffered a breakdown and was discharged due to alcohol and drug abuse. And now, the latest chapter of changes in war portrayal. The time after World War II called for a new approach to represent raw and authentic military experiences. It involved assaulting the senses of sight, smell, hearing, taste and touch. Artists were required to visually represent the sound of exploding bombs, the metallic taste of blood, the dampness of cellars and basically everything that's usually marked by Instagram as sensitive content. 
Eventually, the shock of war horrors pushed artists to understand that conventional forms like paintings and sculpture were not enough. This is actually one of the biggest challenges of creating anti-war manifestos. The tragedy is so big that art seems too small. There is no proportionate response. However, it doesn't mean that creators shouldn't look for one. That's how new forms of anti-war creative statements were born. Namely, installations, public performances, video, land art and so on. Also, the art scene was finally opening up for previously neglected voices, including women, African Americans, Latinos and Asian Americans, who gave their unique responses to the war experience. Now that we've traveled all the way from the past to the present, let's wrap it up for this video. Share which creative anti-war manifesto of the past impressed you the most in the comments section below. Also, keep an eye out for part two. There, we're going to focus on a few remaining questions. How have creatives all over the world responded to Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine? And to leave you with practical tips, what is special about creative manifestos that have the power to impact the world? Thank you for spending your time with us. Make sure you are subscribed to our channel and try not to miss any upcoming videos. And as always, stay creative. See you.